Hey guys, this is Mike Bachman. I'm here with Kyle Ferguson, who is one of the two hosts of the Into the Nexus podcast. Uh, you might also know him from Solo Q&A. Uh, those are the two things I know him from. Say hello. Hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, inviting me into your games. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna teach me how to uh, how to not be how, not be so bad. <laughs> like, you know, I, yeah, I sent him an email and said how not be so bad and he said i will teach you and that's what we're doing here in so many words there are so many great little I, I for lack of a better phrase trigger statements throughout the emails you sent me i think my favorite <laughs> is when you start to catch yourself that you're locked in your mmr and you feel like there's nothing you can do and oh my god i sound like just one of those people well and i know um i know enough about myself and my wife knows enough about myself that i'm like i get really defensive um, and I, it's, it's one of those things where I just had to become self-aware and say, well, you know, even, even if everyone else be bad, um, I can't do anything about that. And it's far more likely that there's just like in my process of raging about those things, there's things I'm doing wrong, uh, that, <laughs> that may help, uh, in those situations where people aren't doing things I feel they should be. One of the best experiences I had for coaching was learning to paint. And my painting instructor said to me, the reason why you get so angry is because you don't have the knowledge to understand what went wrong. And yeah. as you learn, you'll constantly get in this staircase of learning. You take a step because your skills advance and you're that much better. And then in order to take the next step, you have to have more knowledge than you previously had. So you understand how to get better. Then you get better. You get frustrated because you don't understand why you're bad again. Then you have to step up again and again. Mm -hmm. And it goes like that. So it, it is tough, particularly from those we love getting suggestions. So coaching yeah. is a good way to uh, maybe break down that barrier and get on a maybe trusted level where the information can just be absorbed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's dive straight into what you're doing right, because that's important. I like hearing about that. Sense. Yeah. <laughs> you, sir, have the best magic missiles I've seen in this game so far. Nice. <laughs> that may have been the sweetest replay you could have found for me, but these magic missiles on your Li Ming on that Cursed Hollow were fantastic. Sweet. I You're like always early to the objectives. <laughs> you have sol solid mini-map awareness. Nothing ever really catches you completely by surprise when inside your lane. I know that you're looking at your mini-map, you're seeing where other people might be off to. When we get out of lane, that's more of a experience sort of thing. The, mm -hmm. I haven't seen Nova for 30 seconds, my little bell is going off in my head. Right. But that's all just experience. We can make up for that with skill, but if you keep playing, of course, those things get better. Like, Taronda. One of the main ways to counter Taronda is to bait out her stun. That falls from the sky, lands on you, and it sucks. Mm-hmm. And so if you kind of wiggle during the beginning there and see that stun come out, that's when you realize based on that information, okay, cool, now I've got 12 seconds that I can get a little nuts because that stun will be on cooldown. Sure. And that's a lot of what this the next level for you is going to be, but we'll get to more of that in a moment. Cool. So when your team is present, you have really great aggression and some really solid cleanup on Li Ming. When your team is maybe a little more unstructured, there's a lot of holes in what you get up to. But again, more on that in a moment. Sure. Uh, you topped everything in your games as well, and rightfully so. You have had excellent siege damage. Your lasers were pretty darn sweet. Uh, you've clearly figured out that when those minions come down that line and make that sweet little line for themselves, that you can just shoot a laser right across it and yeah. delete the entire lane. On Morales... It was great channeling heal switching. You really took care of your entire team throughout that. And you kept a level head, despite the clear problems in that game, mainly thinking of this <laughs> error tool, who thought he was amazing and wasn't very. Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd have to see it again. I'm not remembering what you're talking about, but... For sure. Yeah, well, I'm either sure. way, either if, if that is a yeah. rare thing for you, congratulations on your step in the right <laughs> direction. And there were times in that where you, you know, when people tried to get accusatory, you said, I know it was me or it's all good guys. Let's continue. So great job keeping the morale up for your team. So one of the main things that I noticed throughout this is going to be that lack of investment based on the things going on around you. Okay. 
And I think the best way to kind of get into this is if we jump into a replay together here. So you should have a friend invite from Tarask. Oh, okay. That'll be me. Excellent. Oh, yeah, it. I did get a friend invite. Yeah. I didn't know who that was, but I was like, sure, I'll take another buddy. Yeah, they're, they're friendly <laughs> enough. I don't. I wish you could attach some sort of message in those things. Right. So let's go to your Cursed Hollow here. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on your Li Ming than your... Oh, let's try that one more time. Excellent. A bit more time on your Li Ming than your Morales, because Morales, while there were some mistakes in there, they're always going to be reactionary to the things going on around you. Sure. So we can, you know, say, oh, they shouldn't have done that, and, and you could have been here, but in the end, everything you did was a result of something someone else did. It's a lot... Did you ever play StarCraft or anything not, like that? Not competitively. Oh, but, well, who does? That's hard stuff. Too, too, too much... Well, I mean, by by competitively, I mean even going online, I, I tried not to. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. That's good. Yeah. Did you play World of Warcraft? Yeah. Hmm. What, what did what was your main role in that game? Um, I played for the first for the first few years. I played a hunter, and then I also in Wrath I leveled a holy paladin, which was in retrospect I'd never do that again. But <laughs> fair enough. All right, cool. So I can't control your camera for you in this current set setting. That's fine. But go ahead and hit the number seven. That'll be you. Okay. And then go ahead and hold the space bar, and we'll lock on to you. And then hit Z while holding down that space bar. Oh, beautiful. Five, so now we're zoomed out. We have a good sight of what you're up to out on the map. I love that he called it the bomb at you. I'd never even thought about that, but yeah. <laughs> now I can't stop seeing it. Right. <laughs> a great response, too. So one of the main things we're looking for here, and we're probably going to watch this to about the 10-minute mark, okay. is an investment in you making your decisions for the strategy you want to pull off and also based around those around you. And that is, whoa, what a statement. But basically, you do some really cool stuff here in lane. You attack Diablo for a bit, then you go attack a tower. Really, one of those things should be the focus from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Attacking Diablo a little bit, he's not going to care. He'll heal up. Attacking the mid lane here is, you know, they're not too deep in. The game's very early. And you throw out the orb, and it sort of misses. But again, it's immediately backed up and retreated from and it was an underinvested gank which left the butcher and gray main kind of confused as to what was being accomplished there okay here you know a little bit of ma mini map awareness nova could have been there she could have been somewhere else and of course diablo was ready for it as well off the site given by nova but i mean look at the xp bar it's not that big of a deal what's just happened to you guys okay it's more of the indecision and the top lane soak is going to waste. It, yeah. If you hit Z again, you can kind of see what you would normally have. And your sight range, and you can see retreating in the background there, is going to be the range in which you gather XP for your team. So a lane like this being attacked by towers and minions as things die, if no heroes around to absorb that, the XP goes wasted. I'm going to go ahead and hit Z again here to zoom back out. But Diablo is pushing, and we start to wail on this tower, which is a good idea. It's a fantastic idea on Li Bing. That front tower plus the gate plus the other tower equals the entire XP of one of those keeps you can get. And that is a big swing in your favor. I mean, you guys could have level 4 for this next engage instead of level 3. And every level making each hero 4% more powerful. That's generally my first goal is to try and is to try and siege down a tower just because she can do it so fast. Excellent. And do. Okay. And because it wasn't an invested idea, we now have this half health Diablo, half health tower with no XP lead for us. Right. And we go into this fight four percent less powerful. And that it can add up, of course. I mean four percent is nothing to scoff at, but the bigger problem comes down to what if someone doesn't report to this fight? And then they're more powerful, and we have a disadvantage of a character. Sure. But again, I mean, just fantastic magic missiles. Throughout this whole thing. Now, let me jump back just a moment here. Okay. One of the other things we can work on with your Li Ming is... 
be ready for the critical mass to track to tick off because right there it goes and instead you're mounted up and that entire time is wasted yeah there was no reactivation of the abilities and that can be tough because every single spell you cast at least on a lower health character you have to assume you're going to get the kill otherwise and here you know it comes down to map awareness but there's butcher and artanis heavily invested in getting that kill and the fact that you missed out on that is is going to break the trust that you all are building particularly this early in the game uh -huh. if they continue to go deep they're going to need Li Ming in the back to deliver all that damage that gets the kills. In particular yeah. here, it comes down to analyzing a little bit of the team makeup. And looking at that here, we can see that we have Artanis as sort of our main tank. He's going with a block build. He's starting to build up all the defensive talents he'll need. Butcher, by his very nature, will overextend and become the secondary tank. One of the things you can do to really break down what the team comp is going to look like and how it's going to operate is to identify who the tank and the off tank is going to be. And there will always be an off tank, no matter what the comp is. So looking at our enemy team, it's pretty clear. Johanna is going to be the main tank. She's slow, she's big, she's helpful. And Diablo is going to be the off tank because he'll misplace people. They may trade based on their skills, but that's the general way it's going to go. If we imagine the enemy team Without Diablo, let's throw a Zeratul in there for whatever reason. Butcher becomes the off tank. If we get rid of the Butcher and Diablo in that enemy team and give it a Raynor, Raynor becomes the off tank because he's the next guy with a self-sustain ability. Okay. And it would be Raynor's job in that case to notice, oh, okay, we don't have a good off tank for us. I need to take some different talents perhaps. And when we get in fights, I will stand my ground, invest myself, and make sure that I'm in deep enough so people like my Zagara, my Kael'thas can be behind me. Okay. So a good engage, the damage zoned them out quite easily. Um, it was a little underinvested, but not one of the main points I wanted to get to. So let's go ahead and actually zoom ahead to the next objective. And I like that you return to your lane. You get all this good stuff going on. There is... If you come at the lane from the side, there is a better chance for you to clear it with an arcane orb. Hitting the front okay, line yeah. usually just lands on a single guy. In fact, if we look at uh, that bottom lane right now, actually, is about to sort of get in formation. You can see the wizard in front would actually absorb the entire arcane orb. And the guys in the back would be entirely free. But if instead we think about how those little minions sort of roll out and lane, it'll be the archers in the back, that wizard in the middle, and the melee knights up front. And attacking it from the side, even going up behind all these trees and delivering it, is going to put it right in that nice little cubby. Sure. Where you can blow up most of the lane. And it's a little yeah. unexpected. You might hit a hero, which is always nice. I think I found when I when I'm attacking a minion wave that's um, that's already stopped. So they've got they've gotten they've gotten out of that line from hitting another wave coming the opposite direction. Um, usually the, I, they're kind of a lot of times in like a U shape. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, now they're in like a almost like a square. And it's like, which direction do I come at it from? It almost seems like it doesn't matter in that case. And that does which, come down to experience a little bit as these okay. waves build together. You'll notice certain patterns in them. Like, in the middle here, we have a great place for a arcane orb to come from the bottom right corner uh -huh. into the middle of that. Right. And, of course, it comes down to, you know, hovering over that W and judging that the orb will meet the exact spot to fit perfectly into that hole and blow up the entire lane. Well, that's just one of the more fun parts of playing Li Ming. Sure. For me, anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, and, definitely. And that can also help you with the broader discussion you wanted to have today about building comps when you start lining up shapes. So if, let's say we have a, a mosh pit, and mm -hmm. a mosh pit goes off and it's in a circle, that means that a Malfurion root for the team would be more powerful because it also makes a circle and would fit on top of that. So if okay. we were choosing with an ETC comp, which burst damage we wanted to have, maybe Li Ming wouldn't be the best option because she attacks things in a straight line with the laser, with the orb flying out, and with the magic missiles. 
In fact, because we're making circles, Jaina would be the better choice because it'll land right on top of the mosh pit in a perfect shape. Okay. So it, it, it's a cool philosophy to think of. It can help you break down a team and how you might work into it. It also does feel a little silly because like you're playing with, you know, little toddler toys, putting a square in the circle, but it can help. That's interesting because I've had really good luck lately with um, we've been doing some five stacks, um, some friends and I, and, and they've been ticking. And had I've had really good luck with with mosh pits. And it's just been, you know, because because like though ETC's mosh pit is a circle, the way that the that the enemy teams oriented might not also be a circle. Right. Like they exactly. might be lined up or. And know. ideally during that, it doesn't matter that it's a circle for you because you're leaming, you kill one, everything resets, you kill the next one, everything resets and just on on to the next guy. OK, so it's it's certainly not a a complete rule that you need to obey all the time. More of a guideline, and not yeah. even a guideline, I would say. Just something to help you break down where your role might fall in the team here. Okay. Because this one's pretty obvious. You are the burst. There's a sustain sort of on Greymane. He can dive in. He can mess up a lot of people. But after that initial dive where he goes, row, 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 and does all his <laughs> little scratches, he then has a reset period. So it'll be sure. your job to come in. If, same if we look at Artanis. He's not a main tank like Johanna or Diablo is going to be. He sustains himself through attacking. And that's how he gets more shields. So if Artanis has closed the distance and is now actively attacking a character, we need to act fast because he's on a time limit. Sure. But also has no way to ever escape. So it, it, Artanis presents a very interesting situation here because if I see Artanis on a character... The fight is called. This We're going nowhere until either Artanis is dead or he wins. And same with Butcher to an extent. If Butcher is in melee range, he can self-sustain himself with that mark and continue to do damage. Yeah. And we, ne we are on a time limit until that Butcher's mark runs out when he starts dying. I also notice a lot in your spells here that you really catered to the S of Johan before the nerf. Um, wh oh, what do you mean? You mean as in... Because I, I never picked it. Oh, really? That's interesting. I haven't picked it a single time. The reason I say that is because you always fire your orbs and your magic missile down the exact same trajectory. Yeah, I've found that um, that people don't, at least at least not yet. I imagine, you know, the longer that she's out, people start to get it. But I found that people don't really expect that much burst at, like to happen all at once. So if they hit at the same time, there's more of a chance that I catch people unaware. Fair enough, and it's more bursts, they're caught off guard, they're more likely to be dead, whereas they get hit by one, then they might wander off and not get hit by the second one. It's a good right. idea, and it works well for the spec you're doing. I, you know, on you know my personal play style, I have some reservations about the spec you choose to go, but it works uh -huh. for you, so I'd like to see you continue it. And everyone should have their own style with everything, even if I really, really like Calamity. Yeah, yeah, I've tried to use Calamity a couple of times, and I think I just, like, unless I'm... I th I don't want to put any other points into her teleport, any other uh, talents into her teleport, mm -hmm. and then, you know, its its range, you know, by default is, is not long enough, I feel, to be for it to be useful. I mean, people are making it work, obviously. I just sure. mean, like, you know... <laughs> for me, I haven't had good luck with it, and it might just be, you know, just the way that I'm using it. Definitely, well... Think about it instead, not as that. <laughs> uh, think about it as your most controllable source of damage. And that's why I choose to like it. In what, what way? If it comes down to I'm chasing some, if, let's say there's someone at close range and they're almost dead. Uh -huh. And it's Vala, just for funsies. Uh, she has a vault. And so for me to hit my magic missile and my arcane orb, that's a difficult move for me to pull off. Yeah. But with a short range teleport, I know exactly where I'm going and what damage I'm going to do. Okay. And that allows me to, in turn, expect critical mass to go off. So, yeah. with your current spec, you absolutely can do this. We would just have, you just have to keep it in your head. And just as I would with Calamity here, but it's a little more nebulous because you're going to fire hopeful arcane orbs and, and very skilled magic missiles at people. But you're not guaranteed to get the kill. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't mind giving up that talent because it's what's the other one? Um, the one that I'm picking now, 
It's like 25% extra damage at max range and like 25% less at close range. Sure, is but we're right? using triumphant right now, so. Is that is that what that is, or? Oh, you're talking about, yeah, you're. In, instead of Calamity. Yes, your vengeance what the name here. Is. Yeah, I, I don't mind giving that up because, you know, sometimes in a bad situation, I have to throw an, throw an orb out, <laughs> you know, at, at a closer range than I'd like to. Fair enough. It does but, make it do less damage. At the same time, right. my reservations about Triumvirate fall into the same category. And so to keep this spec, we're really needing to put that focus on that back part of our mind that goes every time we shoot a spell, we're ready for that next aggressive teleport forward and that next orb and that next magic missile. Sure, sure. And with Triumvirate, it gets that much more complex because if it hits the target above that 65% range, I need to be ready for a now four-second cooldown orb, which is more like a two-second cooldown orb because for the first two seconds of that ability, I was watching it fly through the air not knowing if it was going to reduce the cooldown or not. Right. So my main problem with this particular ability is it adds one more variable into your play that you don't know if you'll be able to get off or not. Okay. But again, you know, personal play style. I want to see different builds. I'm not the kind of person that's just going to lay you the build and say, make it your own. <laughs> this is how I like to play. <laughs> For sure. You have won. So here's a good example of what's happening to our Tannis. So we got Zagara there out of position to an extent, but... With Artanis as our main tank, we are in the prime place to continue to do damage. And the best way to work on that, and I'm going to do a little doodle on the side screen here, is think about the tank as creating a zone behind them in between the two of you. So yeah. Diablo draws a straight line where he's heading, and he might get pushed this way off of Diablo. So it's a very, you know, one-to-one -one visual representation. And then we have Johanna coming in from this direction. So that leaves us with a safe area all between there. And as long as Artanis is alive and kicking in between us and those enemies, we're in a good place to do our job because Artanis is performing his. So I'm going to hit play here. And we can see how this dynamic changed. Yes, you know, he got pushed closer to you than you would have liked. It was a great decision to turn around with the laser. You noticed the straight line. You got off lots of extra damage. Now Butcher's involved. And... Because of the change with Butcher, Johanna isn't able to maintain a melee range attack on you because Butcher will burn through her too quickly. So in that very moment, you decide to wiggle around, hoping to escape Johanna's range. But instead, you should have stood your ground, been confident, because if she had chose to attack you, the Butcher would have destroyed her. Yeah. And she was sandwiched between the Artanis and the Butcher, you were in a very safe zone. Now she's went up into the light, and we adjust back, but it doesn't give us a superior position because Artanis and the Butcher are still creating this really great zone for us. Now we're in one of these sort of situations where Diablo is blocked here, for sure, but also we have Zagar in front of us, and we have Johanna running off that way, so anything back here is really safe. The other thing we can take advantage of is people love to kill Zagar. <laughs> <laughs> and that information can work for us here. If I came into this fight and I'm looking, ooh, you know, I, I just randomly show up. I teleport in from another game and I want to kill you all. My eyes immediately fall on Zagara because of that black part of her health bar there. And I go, mm, she's right there in my face. I can get her. And you are that much more ignorable from the back. And let's imagine you here with full health. And in that position, you are entirely invisible. Everyone would go nuts to kill Butcher and kill Zagara. They'd even try to kill Artanis before you. Uh -huh. So notice in these sort of situations when you can be invisible and how that yeah. might help you to pull off what your team needs for you to do. And Magic Missiles Miss, whatever there. They went where he could have been. He ends up dying. No big deal. We take advantage of the curse we created. And we immediately get to it. I love the laser there. It's actually going to get the kill thanks to Greymane. But also it just said, this is our zone. Get out. And there's a couple of other good situations throughout this match. But we'd be sitting here for 10 minutes again to sort of get to them. And we already saw the best parts. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and quit out of this replay. Go ahead and do the same. And let's jump over to talking a little bit about the various specs and how they can be informed by what our team offers. 
So, let's take a look. Let's take a look at Morales. That was the second replay you sent over to me. Or actually, no, let's stick on Li Ming for just a hot second. All right, so Li Ming. I saw at the end of that match, and it was a current version of this, that you ended up going with the Tal Rasha's elements. Uh-huh. Just yeah, digging I, the damage? I No, I actually stopped doing that. Oh, I, I moved over to... Um, and ta Talent names I'm, I'm abysmal with. So I, Oh, Temporal Flux. That's what I started taking. Cool. Perfect. That Glad to hear it. Slow is real good. Yes, it is. And it creates incredible zones for you, particularly if you're going with this glass cannon arcane orb build where you don't want people to close on you in the first place. If you wanted to do Tal Rashes, there's still a great place for it. The talent pick for it is Ether Walker. Okay. Because then you have a two second cooldown matched with your three second cooldown magic missile. You don't get stuck in those weird rotations where you have to not cast magic missile because you're waiting for something else to come off cooldown. Right. But sounds like you're on the right path. Otherwise, I think your build is pretty darn good. Um, yeah. So commit to the strategy. Notice where people are in lane and how they are trusting you to dish out the damage because they're not going to last forever. So let's move on to Morales here. Okay. And Morales has a lot of really cool things about her. Like I said, you had this great channel heal switching. You had the level head throughout it. There were a couple of odd positioning mistake, mistakes that really just came down to being brave and taking a bit of damage rather than running away. But you had no mana, and they look like scary situations for sure. Uh, some of this comes down to just some understanding of how abilities work, like Displacement Grenade to get characters off of you. By using that Displacement Grenade on Artanis, we can push him back away. He's not getting auto attacks. He's not regenerating his shield faster. And we've done the entire team a service. Yeah. Instead, what can happen is, you know, you get maybe too scared to use it or it's just a lack of information. He continues to wail every single auto attack, starts the cooldown of his shield, and he becomes more tanky as the game goes on. Another interesting thought here is how your comp affected your talent picks and what talent picks change the ways you ultimately play. So let me jump over here to view match history. And this was an Infernal Shrines game, so that wouldn't have been today. That was on the 18th. Let's see here, Infernal Shrines. Is this the one? Yes, Morales, excellent. Cool, so I'm looking at this comp and the enemy comp. I notice Johanna, Nova, Jaina, Artanis, Lili. Leaving them with one real sustain, which is going to be Artanis. So Artanis automatically gets a lot of attention. I want to make sure that he can't continue to engage, get those heavy hits off on me that'll delete me quickly, but also reset his own shield, becomes more tanky. Good, done. The other thing I can see is that after the initial burst from Jaina and Nova, there really isn't going to be a ton of long-lasting damage on their team. These fights aren't going to last forever. If they get in and engage with us and they run out of mana, they will be sitting ducks. There's no Rainers, Valas, things that just continue to attack regardless of their mana pool. So this can inform our level 1 talent pick. The one you went with was a regenerate mana ability after the safeguard expires. But here, to get that mana back, we're already fighting a team that doesn't have a lot of longevity in the first place. Yeah. So another talent would have been more useful. I, I can tell you about that specific talent, that um, that was a misclick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I actually never never pick feedback loop. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I could, I could check here, but I'll trust you. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, there might be... I, I say never. Maybe there's times that I should. But yeah, no, I definitely... Right, and those situations would be against those sustained comps, Nazebos, Valas, Rainers, things that'll just keep on coming regardless if they have no mana left. And that could be a good pick for you there. Yeah. So we got into the lane. The match started. Our first shrine went off. Ding, ding, ding. Everyone runs for it. It's great. You're positioning your heal very strongly. Whoever needs the heal, you're switching it to. And then you end up taking Bio Shield, which causes a target at full health to gain a shield stacking over time. And from that point on, you never adjusted your strategy further to start 
shielding people who had full health. Yeah. And so this became a wasted talent pick. So not that it's not a good talent pick, but there are other talents available that would work better if you don't want to use up that part of your brain, which there's a hundred things to keep track of in this game, understandable. Nothing wrong with that. Or another maybe displacement grenade ability that could have helped us against that Artanis who we sort of identified as the primary problem on the enemy team after the blizzards and everything else goes wrong for us. Yeah, and I find that I, um, especially early game, um, so, you know, sitting at level four when, sh when Morales' mana goes so quickly, um, I don't really want to use dis displacement grenades, so maybe that, you know, the refunded mana would be, would give me a little reassurance there. But I don't know if that's, you know, where my thinking should lie or not. I think that's a great idea. And you are correct. Absolutely. There was, it was your second Infernal Shrines on this map where you didn't cast a single other spell and it was awesome. And I love that you didn't because you had to get those heals out over and over again. You made the right choice there. The other thing that didn't change was you took a Radiate and then your healing didn't change based off of that either. Okay. Um, a Radiate being that it gives a damage aura around them. Now, whenever we don't have anything else to heal, despite putting on shields on top, which have already started to inform how we're going to play at level 7, now we're adding damage on top of someone, so healing that tank constantly becomes a higher priority. Or giving Zeratul, though he may be dumb, a little extra love. <laughs> okay. And then we went on to get Stim, which was also sort of confusing. I don't know if this came down to a straight trust issue on your part, but it always landed on top of ETC, despite the sustain available on our team through Lunara. Yeah, I think um, I I definitely forgot how much of Lunara relies on her auto attack, mm. um, for one. And then I, it, the trust issue with, <laughs> with Medivac is I, I honestly I just don't trust myself to use it well. I've had a couple of really bad um and really bad i mean I, I might just need to pick it and just hope for the best and you know get experience there but there's been a couple of times where like i've sent us into just really bad situations oh for sure and i was referring to your trust issue with the rest of the team not with no i know on your... <laughs> for oh sure. gotcha gotcha but it's more about you know me not trusting myself to use it correctly so i pretty much just stim as an auto pick really that entire build um and this kind of stems to what i was asked you know what i was one to go with is like I you know just I I think I I, I mentioned more um, more like you know rolling with the punches um, for like uh, team comps but also I mean just with with builds um, you know I I'm not good at like making those split decisions you know about which uh, you know which talent I'm gonna pick so I tend to just settle into a spec and I'm doing this with Lee Ming right now too uh, settle into a spec that I just uh, that I just pick every time because I'm comfortable with it. Um, and but... nothing is wrong with that at all. Okay. It's the changes in how you play informed by the spec that need to be worked on. Okay. So picture uh, picture this for an idea because this is a really kind of clear one. Works on Kael'thas as well. Diamond skin. You teleport in and you gain a shield for 20%. 25% used to be 20% now. If that shield absorbs no damage, it was a wasted pick. Okay. And that, you start... You, do you play Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering? Yeah, Magic. Sweet. Magic works even better because mana is that much more rare. Uh -huh. So, not only do you have to draw the darn mana, but you have to get it out in the field and whatnot. Stack it together once a turn. If I spend three mana on a really crappy card here, so a three mana spell that does three damage to something... And I target it on a enemy minion that has one health. Two of that damage is lost, and I've lost mana per damage value. So always be thinking about how you can increase the value of your spells. So if Diamond Skin, if I teleport in and I take no damage, that talent had no value. And if I am Jaina and I land a Blizzard on top of a single target, that had very little value. If I land on top of a mosh pitting group of everybody, it has amazing value. Per point okay. of mana that I've spent. Makes right. sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's a sort of philosophy that you can apply to a lot of different things. Um, so back to the sort of the trust issue thing here with Stim Drone. <laughs> um, I mean, Zeratul, while he was awful, is also a great pick for auto attack speed because he took follow through. 
He took season marksman. We can read these talents and say, Zeratul is not doing a spellcaster build. He is specking himself for auto attacks. Stim is a great application for him. Whereas Lunara becomes, you know, slightly a slightly worse pick because she invests instead in more of a pseudo spellcaster build, but still an excellent pick over ETC. Yeah. Let's see. Was there anything else in this guy? Couples therapy doesn't really matter because it's great. And basically everyone takes it. And then Caduceus Reactor and whatnot. Don't forget that that trait. If you hang out for four seconds without getting hit, you will gain some health back. And also, as we discussed with that little battle with the Li Ming, draw those mental lines between you and your off tank so that you can find yourself the safest area to hang out. And for the most part, you did do this. It was just in those panic sort of team fight moments that this can fall apart and you end up getting shepherded into the top corner yeah. where you were dead. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember exactly what you're talking about. And, and you had no mana. There wasn't even a grenade. You tried to hearth out. You did everything you could, right? Yeah, well, except maybe not be there in the first right, place. Right, right. And then that's, <laughs> you know, and that's the StarCraft conversation, right? Of like, well, uh, there's mutas all over my base and there's nothing I can do. Well, 10 minutes earlier, you should have attacked the base so there wouldn't be mutas. And, and right. that's just real-time strategy. Yeah. So looking at this team comp, we can very quickly identify who our off-tank is. It's Zeratul. And Zeratul even has that little extra oomph to him that everybody wants to kill Zeratul. Uh-huh. So if a Zeratul becomes low health, he will be heavily targeted. Uh, basically, as soon as Zeratul pop, I can make little rules for myself for this team comp to make things easier. As soon as Zeratul pops out of stealth, the enemy burst is going to go hog wild on him. Nova will be around, Jaina will be around, and they all like killing Zeratul. So the second I see him pop out of stealth, I will safeguard him. And if he requires healing, I will heal him instead of the tank. Either one are good choices because if they're at full health, I'll give them a shield. And if they're not, regardless, I'll be doing damage in the area around them. And they are applying my damage in the melee range, which is what it has to be done at. So are you, th are you saying that regardless of what our, what our team comp is, even if we have no you know official tanks, still considering who would be the tank and off tank in that in that situation exactly and it's and it's your job and that person's job too to recognize that in themselves if we had four ranged assassins and a gray main gray main needs to realize in himself that he has become the tank in that situation we can help him out you know we might be able to put turrets around his gas low or make sure that I always put my bomb right on top of him so because I know people will go on him as the melee character we can maybe take you know if we're ETC and all we have is ranged assassins I might take a talent or two that provides healing to my group on the echo pedal and whatnot it, everyone can kind of make these little choices along the on the way to help that out yeah okay Ultimately, your aggression and your positioning will be decided by the information presented to you on the map. And that comes down to map awareness, which you already have a lot of. It's clear you're never really caught off guard when dudes arrive on the scene, the scene to attack you. But you're not taking advantage of their missing. So there'll be a fight in the top lane where you know it's 2v1. I can count everybody on the mini-map and you don't get any more crazy than you otherwise would. Yeah. And same goes for level lead, particularly if I'm Li Ming. I mean, let's say, like it's been going in quick match right now, there's a Li Ming on each side. Yeah. If yeah. I have the level advantage, I it is my duty to my team to get crazy and try to kill that Li Ming because I'm, well, I, yeah, they just changed it. So I'm 3.5% more powerful than her. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Any questions on that? verbal blast of information <laughs> no no it um i not not offhand that makes a lot of sense cool yeah so any questions about your general statement when you came to me so you you asked some great great questions throughout this initial email you sent to me um of course i asked for the replays because there are many different levels and mmr is one that i don't trust to base skill on yeah you could be the most amazing bronzer and have the worst luck in your life. And it was really cool that I got to see so much skill in here for someone in your league. 
And that means it really does come down to this bigger conversation of positioning, noticing advantages, but also before you even get in the game, reading the team comp. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what kind of questions do you have in that area if you don't have any about the previous section? Well, yeah, I guess it's just, um, I mean, and I, I started watching some of the uh, some of the solo Q&A shows and I noticed the way that you've got it set up um, or at least at least what you display on the screen is that you've got a couple of heroes listed for for, you know, each character for each category. So you got, you know, tank burst, sustain and heals. Um, that was that's all I saw in there anyway. Um, for sure. And so, I mean, I've right now I've been, you know, in a, in a position where it's like when I, um, I jumped into some hero league, I hadn't been doing it before I sent you the email initially, but I, um, that's more just been, I've been having such a bad time with it that <laughs> lately I've just been afraid of it. Um, but, um, I've, you know, I've right now, um, my situation is basically like I'm, if I'm a high, if I'm an early pick, um, I'm grabbing Li Ming, but otherwise I end up in a situation where, you know, everybody just locks in that pick, you know, right away and there's no discussion. Um, and, and even if I'm, you know, trying to ask, you know, ask around be like, Hey, you know, how, how are you going to do this? Um, you know, and people just, just kind of grab stuff. They don't respond until like the last pick and we're like you know five seconds left then people like start complaining about our comp until there's something to complain about right right and so it's you know it's a i guess it's just like you know i end up i end up looking for like you know what we're missing which nine times out of ten in my experience has been a tank and i keep and that's why like my most wins in hero league is with johanna whereas before i didn't really didn't have any because i was you know that was when i was i was still new and i was just picking like what i knew which at the time i think i was playing a lot of nova um and so i started you know i I bought johanna and then i just started when she was really good um and then just would would pick her every time because nobody i felt like nobody wanted to tank and even less people wanted to heal um so i was just trying to like fill those fill those gaps but and, when I when you guys talk in the podcast, I hear or on into the nexus, I hear you talk a lot about like getting to rank one by like just picking you know, by like sticking with like two or three heroes that you're really good with. For sure. And that worked well for me. And it came down to not just like the meta picks. It was just what I could also surprise the enemy team with. But one of the most powerful things you can do for yourself if you're confused about what to take into Heroes League is find that sweet spot between your win rate and your loss rate. So last, uh, the game's changing all the time. So I've only got last 30 days here. Right. And even that kind of takes me outside of what is actually happening in the meta a little bit. But I can go to win rates versus other heroes here. And it's great seeing some guys up here like awesome. Rhaegar, great. Great job. Kael'thas, sure he's in a bad place right now, but still it takes awareness to know the living bombs. Tyrande's up here. We got Lately up here. It's so many great people that I want to see up top. Stitches, all these sort of cheesy guys. Ten wins against Sylvanas, apparently. You're a destroyer. Nazebo's doing great. These are these are the win rates that you have against them. And mm-hmm. then we start getting below the 50%. And if you can find that sweet spot of a role you need to fill with a character you lose against, that's the one for you to take. Okay. Blindly, regardless of any sort of talent or... Uh, comp advantages that you'll have against the enemy team. So, so you're saying you're saying to look for the look for the counter to something somebody that I lose against a lot, or I'm not. I guess I'm not following you. That's a choice you could do, but instead, what I'm saying here is, if you like Diablo and you have a high win rate with Diablo, you lose against Diablo a lot. So draft Diablo. Now you can never lose against him. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. while you might continue to take Li Ming all the time, it's actually an interesting choice because we have Li Ming here at a 55% win rate. That's not crazy. That you know, That's not anything we need to stop taking Li Ming from. But when you fight her, you usually win against her probably because you know her so well. Uh-huh. So if you were looking for, let's say, you know, you really want to add a sustain damage to your group. And sustain being, of course, that they keep on doing damage after their mana has gone away. And, you know, despite having lots of siege damage, Zagara could be the role for you if you're looking for something that gives sight. Lunara, also, you know, 14% win rate in seven games. That could be a pick that you take for your own 
and now have I mean, 86 percent win rate for sure ideally so that's one of the main places to look when you're lining up your main roster that you're going to put together for yourself I, ideally of course there's about three people you really want to go in with and those are the ones you really are passionate about enjoy because if you're passionate about them you're playing them in quick match when you're feeling casual and when you go into heroes league they will be well practiced i don't know man i'm passionate about hammer but nobody seems to want me to take him in hey i love hammer <laughs> i don't know what's that look at, and hammer's even down here in the 25 percent loss against yeah. So there is some evidence here to suggest that Hammer would be a good pick. Now, Hammer is better on certain maps, of course. Right, right. And I personally love Hammer, but it if I didn't understand what Hammer was up to, I could become easily tilted by what she does. If yeah. I If I am the support or I am the tank and we get a Hammer on my team, I'm not the shot caller anymore. And that's where people really start to get tilted. And there's no reason for it, right? I mean... Hammer Siege is up. She's in range of a fort. In fact, let's grab a little let's grab a little doodle here. Infernal Shrines is the main map for her. And it's the job of everyone on your team to recognize this. So Hammer likes hiding out in this little corner here. Yep. And firing over this entire area. Fantastic ability. Great. I love it. Everything. If Artanis, the enemy Artanis, comes booking in here, sees that she's firing over that. If I'm that Artanis, my first thought is, sweet, Hammer all by herself. I'm going to swap with her. And we'll get some business done, and my whole team will clean her up now that she's exposed. Uh huh. So now, despite being the tank, and I should be the one with the CC that engages and makes all these cool plays and the epic mosh pits that win us the game, I recognize Hammer made the call. She chose to siege there. I am now going to position myself here as ETC when I see that Artanis come running in. Yeah. If I saw something coming up around from this way, it would be my job to occupy this area because hammer is doing something so shot calling important that I have to support it. Now, if, but if, if that's the case, if say I'm taking in hammer and, you know, and I'm calling the shots at this level, at the level that, that my MMR puts me at now, I, I mean, I don't really feel like I can, I can rely on that, rely on anybody to recognize that I'm calling a shot. I think they, you know, the way that I feel it's expected of me now is that, you know, a team fight's happening, and then I find my position to to influence it. Um, when I do siege up, I find like you know, team fights get pushed out of my range, and then I'm yeah, I'm forced to reposition. And that's the sad fact of the MMR you're in. Yeah. In which case, okay. it may not be best to take hammer at this current skill level. Instead, continue to work. You know, with Lee Ming, something people understand and trust you with to deliver. Okay. Uh, you know, as Hammer, if I'm quick matching that situation, I just really want to play Hammer tonight. I jump in a game and I notice that nobody's responding to my calls. I can counter that before things go badly. And just being like, protect me for the win, smiley face. <laughs> and as simple <laughs> as that is, those sort of things can throw a game in your favor. Sure. And I always make sure as a philosophy that I always say them before anything happens. If I am on, let's go to Dragonshire and I'm down in the bottom. Uh, let's say I'm, I'm Rainer. I've never need anyone to visit the bottom the entire game. I've always been very self-reliant. I continue to hold this bottom, but the top has been a madhouse. And all of a sudden on the mini map, I notice that my lane is empty. The middle lane is empty now. And Zagara is pushing the top all by herself. There's a myriad of things I could say to her when I know she's going to die anyway. But the common thing for MOBA players to type is just care. Care top. And that just means, hey, I hope you're aware. It's cool if you're not. But look out. Everything's missing on the mini-map. There's most likely incoming on your position. Right. And should they die, they hit that enter button. They're about to go, oh, why didn't anyone call missing? Blah, And they see that care. It was countered. They can't be aggressive. They, sure, they can be tilted in their own heads. But there's no aggression for them to leak out on my team and it won't affect our camaraderie. So in that situation, should I should I do that or should I do a danger ping? Danger pings guess, work the exact same way. Except that they can't look at them afterwards and see that they went out. Exactly, and that's why I okay. choose to use the text. Gotcha, okay. So on Dragonshire here, these maps can often devolve into battling over the three lanes. The middle gets forgotten about, and the top and bottom lane just become this chaos house. 
and whoever wins those three v2s or two v3s ends up taking the entire game mm -hmm. after the level 10 mark it's actually the job of anyone on the team and this is a great place where you know if you feel you want to take up this role you can direct the entire game regardless of what role you're in and that's just to say it's past level 10 it's at the 13 minute mark those death timers are starting to get over 30 seconds they're getting a little scary when this shrine starts to open up and the timer starts ticking just yell everyone bot hold bot everyone and there's a number of advantages to that uh one is it's the bottom and i love the bottom for a lot of reasons the camera always angles slightly upwards mm -hmm. and there's no there's a very small chance that a gank will come at me from the bottom because they'll have to go all the way around down here and then all the way and that puts them in tower range too so it's not anything they want to accomplish Sure. In the top lane, there's those bushes right here, which stealthies love to pop out of. There's a chance that someone might come up around this way, have that stealth bush there, where they're never in tower range to get me. It's a very dangerous lane. We're more likely to win the team fight if we hold the bottom and then branch out to the other lanes when someone is dead. And if they choose not to, if they go, if the enemy team goes, well, I, I know they're entrenched in there. We're not going to come down there and deal with them. We'll just push the top lane. Excellent. Whatever. You've got two sieged camps here that you can take and double push with. Okay. So that's an example of a situation where regardless of your role, a little bit of text adventuring can help the entire <laughs> team out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Uh, there's also this tool here. It's under Hero Details and Team Draft Helper. It can help you. It's mostly based on win rates, so it's not the most perfect tool in the world. If, if I go down to to Nova here, there might be so few games played between Anova and Abathur that it doesn't have any information for me to look at. Right. Like it, has I, no, it has no idea what the win rate is with a Murky. It can take yeah. its best guess. but <laughs> I looked at this the other day, and I just for fun tried to get like tried to pick what the highest like win percent uh team comp would be and it was it was a little weird yeah i mean if we just yeah. go up it might be true but right but when now the second we had lost vikings to it we jumped from what a uh, hundred and seventeen thousand games played over the last week to right. you know what a thousand seven hundred yeah but yeah, we cut sure. them out you know we we had thrall in here we had diablo and we had zagar and hey we've got the best team comp that it can make at the moment and this can be a cool idea if nothing else to just sort of put together and decide for yourself what you would do in this situation so Rhaegar, Thrall, Diablo this is going to come down to how Thrall and Rhaegar choose to play but there's a clear off tank in Rhaegar or Thrall and when they roll out on the field I will begin to immediately start judging them as to who's going to be my priority Make yeah. sense? Yeah, definitely. So same thing happens with healing as well. It's not as important on Morales because you have this channeled heal that is always powerful no matter when you cast it. On something like Uther, I cast a my biggest heal. I'm out on cooldowns for 12 seconds. So I had to make sure that heal landed on the exact guy that is going to win the game for me. And if I get into this game and Rhaegar sucks and Thrall's amazing, I have no question as to who I'm going to cast it on. Right. Right. So that that adds another layer on top of it. Right now, the best thing you can be doing for your current skill bracket and just attention, you know, attention span, it's just not too much information to keep in your head all at once, is as you get into that game, identify exactly what you're most concerned about and then judge them to see if they're actually going to be able to pull off the skills you're afraid of. Sure. So I hate Kael'thas. I hate fighting Kael'thas. I hate li living bomb and having to run away from each other and deal with all that biz. Mm -hmm. But sometimes Kael'thas runs out and he's just a dummy. And he dies to everything. And all yeah. my fears were unfounded. <laughs> and now it's time for me to take all that energy and place it on someone else. Okay, cool. Kael'thas is no good. Now I'm taking my mental space and I'm working on Lunar or uh, Taronda's stun cooldown of 12 seconds and counting that out in my head every time I see a stun. Yeah, that's that's a lot of stuff to remember. It, it is. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. And that's why you break it down for yourself. Right. Right. So okay. I would if, if you're up for it, take that time, go through your match history a little bit and, you know, just click on any random game, you know, and just see 
why you might have lost it. Let's grab, uh, we'll grab this random Cursed Hollow here with Johanna. Wait, I'm sure Lily picked an ult. It was probably Cups. That would be funny if she just left it sitting, yeah. but I'm sure she hit it. So we are the Johanna on, okay, so cool. So we are the losing team for this one. We had a Leoric, a Thrall, a Vala, and a Morales. All right, so my first concern as Johanna here is making sure that I can become the main tank because that's why I picked the tank in the first place and that Leoric will be off tanking for me. Great, looks like he took some talents that suggest that he's a bit more of a brawler. Excellent, cool. Next concern for my team is I want to make sure that Thrall and Leoric can still get by me and I don't body block them. We're still at three, which is about the maximum amount of melee heroes I want before things start getting really clogged. So we're in a good position there. Excellent. Anything I have to do to Morales? Not really. I'm just going to do my tanking biz and I trust Morales to keep me alive. As long as I don't body block my current melees. Then I look at the enemy team and I think, okay, so I'm up against an ETC with a Lili backing her up. All right, my first step is going to be to check Lili's spec. I'm, I'm going pretty deep here, so I apologize. No, uh, no, it's great. But this is just sort of my, my flow of consciousness when I'm looking at these. I check Lili's spec. I see her level one talent pick was not a serpent pick. Not always the case. Uh, so, some serpent builds choose to go with the Conjurer's Pursuit instead of the initial serpent talent, so it's not always the best place to look. But here I see Protoss, <laughs> nice, nice blizzard. Um, it has increased range. Okay, neat. So ETC's power slide often carries him outside the range of Lili's heal. So if I see ETC power slide in, normally I'd say let's kill the ETC. But Lili went a level one town that is going to increase her range, so that won't be the case. I will try my hardest not to burn down ETC because he probably won't outrange the healer. Sure. And then I move on to... What else is there? What what else can I see? Nazebo can't really control much of he, what he's up to. Zagara can't do too much what she's up to. If she puts out a Hydra and it has less health than it has time life, excellent. I'll try to kill it for my team. But otherwise, Zagara and Nazebo, they're specialists. They'll do their own thing. My, my attention then falls to Kael'thas. If I can put myself in those nice little lines between myself and... And my Thrall is my main target here. I can absorb the stun. So if we're running into a fight in this direction, and Kael'thas walks around the corner like this, and he's like, Ashala, blah, blah, and what, whatnot. <laughs> and Thrall is, let's say, here. Coming in. I will curve my engage to make sure I'm stepped in front of Thrall should that stun come out. Because I'm the tank, I want to absorb CC and burst damage. Yeah. And then as soon as I have noticed that spell go off, excellent. I'm on the cooldown in my head. He's my primary concern of all the cooldowns here, maybe outside of Mosh Pit. And I'm starting to think, when's that next one coming? I have absorbed it. We dodged it. And now I can choose to get aggressive and do that other curve that's going to let Thrall by me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sometimes all it takes is lines, man. <laughs> yep, that's all. I mean, really, <laughs> this game could be played just on the mini map. It'd be a bad game. It wouldn't yeah. be very interesting. But I, I have considered like, would that be an activity? You know, maybe just like grab X split, just grab the corner of the screen and spread it across the whole thing and play it like that. Maybe. How would you control your mouse though? Well, that, that's the other thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'd have to leave it just in the corner and never misclick. Right. It'd be, it'd be a very wacky game. Actually, no, that'd make a great after show game. I might do that sometime. You should. So any other questions regarding that sort of line of thought? Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, Johanna is probably one of those where it's like, I, you know, I have, I've had more success with her than most in Hero League. Um, but I'm, I mean, I'm only sitting at like 11 wins with her. Uh, but with her, I feel like, like the only, like what I can do there, you know, I've got a I've got a stun. Her slow is, you know, not so good. Um, I pretty much, I feel like I'm there for, for body blocking and like, and, and, and blinds, I guess, you know, like I'm not really calling any shots with her. Sure. You know, and I mean, is that, am I mistaken there or is it? Not at all. I, you okay. are going to have your, your stun, your shield. Uh -huh. 
most likely, yeah. right? Yeah, I have cool. been picking that for sure. Cool. And that's going to be a primary engage that you have. There so when you get in as Johanna, as a teammate of yours, I'm looking for you to make smart engages because you have no movement speed abilities for the most part. Right. Once you bite off a group of the team, and that's what Johanna does, is you know, unlike Diablo, where it's like one dude, grr, grab him, push him back, kill this guy, everybody. Johanna's gonna walk in and just grab a big old handful with that circle condemn. And it's up for the rest of the team to sort of make what they can of it. Mm -hmm. You're sort of this juggernaut going in. At level 10, I now have an engage with the Blessed Shield that I can shoot out. Hopefully get a couple of stuns out and my team will notice who those stuns are. If I'm having difficulty performing those sort of feats, I need to change up my spec or my way of playing. Yeah, with when when I'm if I'm being followed into an engagement, um, I guess I, I I haven't had good luck with using Blessed Shield as an engage, mostly because by the time, you know, if if you figure that the team's behind me and I'm moving in first and I throw out that stun, by the time the stun wears off, I mean, it's not it's not enough time for my team to get there. Right, and that mean, and that is absolutely correct. You know, for the okay. most part, unless you're actively chasing someone with really, really low health, and you have a Lunar on your team, there isn't really going to be anyone to close that distance. That's so, what I use it for: is when I when an, when a team fight when a team fight turns and it looks like everybody like the other team's going to bail, then I'll I'll throw out I'll throw out the shield. And it's not as popular as it used to be now that Muradin's gotten quite a few nerfs, particularly with the Avatar mini stun. That used to be a part of the ability. But let's yeah. pretend we're Johanna here in the middle. And our whole team is ranged. Kind of a scary situation. Puts a ton of weight on us. Um, of course, one of those characters needs to acknowledge in themselves. Whether it's Lily because she, you know, at level 20, when she takes damage, she has decreased cooldown. She becomes the off-tanker. Rainer, you know, one of those characters. Someone here is going to be the prime character after you're down or have been passed to become the tank. That's their job. That's no concern of ours. So our whole team is up here. Let's say we have a Muradin and a Greymane on our team. So the enemy team engages, and the first thing Muradin does is leaps right over you to go engage your squishies. And then Greymane jumps right past you to engage your squishies. Before this fight, you should have noticed in the enemy team comp that this was probably how they were going to play. You could have watched some of the other lanes, perhaps, you know, just taking a quick look to see if Greymane was good or not. And they'll most likely do this. That's when you're sh saving the shield for, and that's when you would hit them, readjust backwards, and condemn so they're right in front of you again. Right. All right. Okay. The other thing you can do is body block your own teammates. Honestly. Mm -hmm. If your thrall is a complete dummy and he keeps running past you, body block him. <laughs> if people are always overstepping you, and you'll know this by... Uh, let's see. Is it level... Yeah, I don't really like the talent, but 25% movement speed could put you back out in front if someone like Thrall continues to overstep you on engages. Yeah. So this could be a good talent pick for this level. Um, the rest of Johanna is really going to be reactionary, but it's extremely important that you are reactionary as Johanna. Yeah. You got to make sure that blinds aren't just for fun. That they yeah. land on targets oh, yeah. that are already invested and already attacking you and all that, so they actually miss attacks. It sounds like you're already kind of down with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I've noticed, I, I kind of came back to her and played her after a long time off, and I, I noticed that my blinds were not as good as they were. But yeah, I used to, when I was playing her a lot, that was my main concern, was making sure somebody was actually fighting before I tried to blind. Exactly. And then, like, your next concern is punish. Does a slowing effect for 60% decaying over two seconds. I hate you decays, but they exist in the game. That means for only the first millisecond will this actually be a 60% slow, then down to a 30% slow, and by the last millisecond of it, they barely feel it. Yeah. So I never want to punish anything that is currently in a Kael'thas gravity lapse or hit by a Muradin stun because they won't even feel this when they come out of that stun. They'll feel a 30% slow, which won't feel very special. Instead, they go up in the air from the gravity lapse, they come back down, and that's when I hit them with the punish, so they feel that real ooh of it, and just really feel every little bit of everything I put on them. Yeah. Okay. And hey, while we're just doing general tips, 
Never forget how the power of using teleport on Li Ming to mess with people's minds. Never walk anywhere, teleport. It can get mana expensive, sure, but at 20 mana, it's not that big of a deal. And you probably run into those pro Zera tools where in your head you're going, there's nothing I can do against this. This guy's incredible. Usually what they're doing is whenever they blink, they're just blinking into a bush and riding their horse away. If you yeah. look at the replay, they're usually not up to anything too incredible. But when you're in this lane fighting them, if I were engaging on Li Ming here and she suddenly disappears and I go, oh, where's she? She's standing right here probably. But there's that mental part of our of our monkey brains that just goes, no, she's gone. There's nothing I could have done. <laughs> she's amazing. Well, I mean, but her, you know, especially with the spec that I'm using, her, ta her teleport range is so short. It's like, it's only a handful of places I could be. And if I'm standing next to a bush, that's probably it, though, right? Right. It, that does. And I would make that logical decision and go check the bush. But with Zeratul, a larger spell range on that guy, it can yeah. be that much more surprising. Yeah, that's true. And if, you know, if I need to... Sure, I could dodge a, you know... I, I don't know why I'm coming with Tychus grenades. I haven't seen them very often. But if I'm dodging a Tychus grenade and I could walk out of it, I'll teleport instead just to get in their heads. Oh, yeah. And let them yeah. know how awesome I'm going to be this whole game. So that when we get into that fight, they're all doing the same exact thing I am. If I'm the assassin, I'm constantly looking at the enemy team to see who's the worst so I can feed off them. A little bit of Dota in there, since in other MOBAs there's active gold, and if I kill everything by myself, I get points that rocket me to a god levels. Yeah. Whereas here and here is a storm, everything's shared, so it's not as important of a skill to have, but still, you know, can make or break a team, particularly when they're all trusting you to deliver the goods. Right. Okay. Any questions about any of that? I don't think so at the moment. Cool. I think we've ironed them out. Excellent. Well, looks like we burned through all of our time here <laughs> pretty quick. I was hoping we could get in a game together. Um, and we, st we still can off air anyway. Yeah, sure. You have my I'm... friend code now. So if you see me hovering over quick match, let me know. Yeah. Quick match to me is practice land. I'll probably be playing something I'm no good at anyway. So give me a message a if you ever want to join. Absolutely. This is this is really great. And an awesome value. I learned a ton of stuff. Um, but uh, where can people find you? Well, you can find orders for lessons like this over on kyleferguson.com. You can find me on Twitter at Kyle Ferguson. Everything's Kyle Ferguson. Uh, Twitch, the solo Q&A show that happens Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Pacific time is at twitch.tv slash Kyle Ferguson. And you can check out ITN, the Into the Nexus podcast. That's all produced over on amove.tv. I, you know, interesting, interesting thing is I knew nothing. I played a little bit of League and I was awful at it and I'd sworn off MOBAs entirely, um, played a little bit of Heroes and then got into into the Nexus. And it's it's absolutely taught me everything I know. I went from zero knowledge. So, well, it's uh, it's only stuff. fair that I return the favor because your all show Drunks and Dragons <laughs> got me through Montana so many times that darn state it's beautiful but it, it gets real boring and i had to make several long long distance trips last year and your guys show entertained me along that long lonesome road so i appreciate you guys and what you do that is the most exciting thing i told i told everybody about that because it was like you know when it's it was it's a weird situation where you said you got up to like what like episode 120 yeah yeah, so so you've listened to like and some of those early episodes are really long. We had like two and a half hour episodes early on um, before we started reining that back in. But like you've listened to tons of hours of my voice. I've listened to tons of hours of your, your voice, but this is the first time we've ever spoken. <laughs> so it's a really bizarre situation. I, I've gotten used to it at this point, but certainly when I first got into podcasting and we started doing interviews, I would be like, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, I speak. Oh, I speak now. I'm just I'm used to listening to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please, please. Exactly. Continue. So, but yeah, anybody, um, anybody who's interested in playing HOTS um, and, and even if you're interested in other MOBAs, HOTS has taught me a ton about positioning and things that carry over into Dota and League. So um, definitely listen to Into the Nexus and, and learn a lot of stuff. So, all right, that'll do it, I think. Sweet. Well, don't be surprised coming out of this if you lose a bit more. You're going to have a ton of thoughts in your head. Yeah. For and 
and a lot of people experience a short downswing after a lesson. And then after they've digested the information, maybe reviewed the email a couple times with all the sort of tidbits to it and watch the rewatch the video, it'll start making more sense to you. And, and be careful too, because you're now taking that next step. You've increased your knowledge base, which means everyone around you is going to look real bad. <laughs> and it can be so frustrating increase, increasing that knowledge base until you've taken that step up in skill and put yourself with more skilled people yet again. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think I've ju I'm just um, you know I kind of made the decision the past couple of days that I'm just going to jump back into Hero League because I'm at, I'm at, I don't know what I was afraid of. I'm at rank 36. It's not like I can go much further down. I hit 40 and that's that's bottom of the barrel. So might as well just just do it. Just do it. Did, did you finish your placement matches yet? Oh, yeah. No, oh, I've, okay. I've been done with placement matches for a long time. But I Good. Just, At least you know. that's out of the way. That's a bit of a slog. And I get I even got bored in there and ended up throwing some games just to get through them already. Right. Right. So, yeah. All right. 